Hello everybody, welcome to another reaction video. This is going to be the Second Age Begins Middle Love Lore Documentary by Wizard and Warriors. Now, uh, this channel mostly focuses on lore like fantasies from different worlds like Dragon Age, uh, uh, World of Warcraft, and then you have uh, the Elder Scrolls, and now they are doing the Lord of the Rings. They did a fantastic job with the First Age. Uh, it is um, very almost I think it's like four hours almost, a documentary just on the first age. Now, when it comes to the Lord of the Rings, I am a massive fan of Tolkien. I love Tolkien's world. I love the world of Arda. I love the lore of it. Uh, when it comes to the second age of uh, the lore of the second age, honestly, it's pretty boring. I have to be honest here. It's just meh nothing really happens like sure you have the uh, the death of Sauron's uh, physical bodies but not the spiritual one you have the creation of the rings and the Nazgûls you have the uh, the fall of Numenor which is probably the like the only significant event of the second age and then you have the the, the the creation of the kingdom of, kingdom of honor and the kingdom of Gondor I think they were called different now they probably called Gondor my lore on the the world of Arda is a little bit rusty to be honest because as I said I haven't really focused on the Lord of the Rings lore for now a very long time but I remember several things about them because they, it's just so good like it's so rememberable especially the first aid the first aid is just oh you have to i rec highly recommend the first aid documentary the wizard and warriors had done it's so good and it it just makes you think like why 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 couldn't they do a first aid tv series instead of that garbage <laughs> That pure puking, disgusting smelling cadaver of the Rings of Power. It was such a butcher, like they murdered Tolkien's beloved world. Like, ugh! If that TV series gets a season two or something, ugh! Stay the hell away from it. It's 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 a abomination of a lore video or a lure, some anything that has anything to do with the Lord of Rings. Keep that. Walk away from the Rings of Power. It's such a disgusting. I don't want to call it dip, this not description but the cap the caption or whatever it's called display like it's it's just an abomination it's so bad and it doesn't follow the actual lore of the order and it just uh uh rings of power i already done a review on that uh, disgusting now i mean the documentary the, the wizard and wars made on the first age it's it, it's baffling it's baffling and mind blowing that a youtube channel can do the lore and it's so fascinating and captivating it's around the Lord of the Rings way better than a billion dollar TV show like from the made by Amazon the most richest company in the world who butchered the Lord of the Rings or the, the or well the Lord of the Rings lore like it's such a shameless uh Ugh, no, I don't want to talk about Rings of Power. It sucks. I don't want to talk about it. It's it's gone. <laughs> now, Second Age, honestly, it's kind of like considered to be a little bit more calm compared to the other ages. Like the Third Age, if I remember correctly. Did Kingdom, Kingdom of Angmar, did, did that happen in the Third Age? And the fall of Aenor and... Um, the establishment of Go Rohan, was that the third age or was it second age? I don't remember exactly. I think, because I do know the uh, Bilbo and the, no, uh, Foreign Expedition or Companies, something like that. 
uh, happened during the Third Age. And obviously the War of the Ring happened during the Third Age, or by the end of the Third Age, uh, when they destroyed the ring and the coronation of uh, uh, Aragorn, who actually, who was then renamed to Elisar, I think it was, Elisar I, and then the Fourth Age uh, began. Uh, at least there's something more happening in the, key, in the Third Age, but the Second Age... <sighs> The only significant thing that I remember was the, as I said, the fall of uh, Sauron or the death of, death of Sauron's physical body and the uh, creation of the ring. Was the last alliance the, in the Second Age? As I said, my lore knowledge of the, the world of Arda is very rustic. So... Um, I'm happy they're doing this because it's going to update my memory memory of it all. But still, the, you can't beat the first age. I mean, more Melkor and the Morgoth, of the Ingoliath and the War of Wrath. I mean, the the Valor. This all oh, this so cool. The Fall of Gondolin. All of that and the, the uh, what the I what was the the big dragon called? Um, Glow wrong something like uh, such a good storytelling, so good. Ah, oh, man, I want to see. I want to see a movie or a proper made TV series about the first ace. That would be so cool. But no, we got the shit. I'm not gonna talk about it. I rent my rent is over with that. Let's begin with this. It's around 50 minutes, 14 actually. Wow, shorter than I expected. Um. Let's jump into it. Oh, that was loud. It has long been said that passionate beginnings foment destructive ends, and Fëanor's hubris was to bring with it the fulfillment of this old adage as the first age of Middle-earth came to an end. The sinking of Beleriand and the raising of Numenor from the darkest depths of the vast ocean bookended this forever altered Middle-earth. The Second Age of Middle-earth, in contrast to its precursor, began with a period of relative calm and prosperity. Mm. However, as was the recurrent theme in Tolkien's writings, a dark lord was soon to rise and bring with it a crushing end to such a peaceful epoch. In this series, we will detail... Uh, I'm sorry, but I am going to pause here and there because I want to talk a little bit here about my knowledge about uh, Arda. If I remember correctly, uh, during the fall, well, by the end of the War of the Wrath and the inter intervention by the uh, Valar to bring down uh, Morgoth, I because Morgoth is one of the most powerful Valar. He was the most powerful war uh, Valar of them all. However, uh, by the end of the War of the Wrath, if I remember correctly, he had he had spent so much of his power to create all of this. Uh, Bal not Bal Balrogs were willingly joining uh, Mel Melkor back then, uh, but orcs and uh, werewolf and uh, dragons mostly and spiders probably and uh, other sorts of things. He had spent so much of his power that. Eventually, even Sauron became uh, even more powerful than uh, Morgoth by the end of um, by the end of the War of Wrath. So, in in about, I would say probably by the end of the Second Age, maybe even during the beginning of the third, before the War of the Last Alliance, I think Sauron was was as. Uh, Powerful as Morg Morgoth was during the almost the beginning of the War of Wrath, something like that. Power leveling, that sort of thing, it, it's haywire right now, I know. But uh, but I feel, if I remember correctly, Sauron wasn't as uh, powerful by the Second Age. He he still had an immense amount of power because he's a Maya, if I if I remember correctly. Originally. Because you have Iluvatar, the one god, then you have the Valar, which is kind of like the angels of this world. Um, 
Was it the Maya who was the below the Valar? And Mayas are considered to be kind of like a demigods in sort of way, N not born from the from any you know, of the Valar. Man, I need to upgrade my <laughs> uh, knowledge about that. Um, but that's kind of like the hierarchy that I remember it. Iluvatar, Valar, Maya. And um, Ma most of the Mayas, uh, not all of them, but uh, very many of them joined Melkor and many of them became like Balrogs. Hmm. Interesting. This world is amazing. I mean, the, the detail is just... It's so cool to, to actually read about it. In I actually was... When the Lord of the Rings movies came out, I was a massive fan about, of, of them, absolutely. But I wasn't as big as a nerd about it as I am today. today. Back then, it was more like Star Wars. Nowadays, it's it's kind of like total reverse. Star Wars, it's dead to me. I don't want to hear about it anymore. And the Lord of the Rings and that sort of thing is just so good. It's so awesome to read about it. It's also because this is the Bible of fantasy. That is something people kind of forget. Is that Tolkien created the Bible of high fantasies. Sure, there were a lot of folklore and religion and mythologies that began with all of this like Norse mythology had a lot had a lot of elves dwarves and goblins and that sort of thing but and uh, Tolkien pretty much borrowed well a lot of things uh, from the Norse uh, and the Scandinavian folklore and then you have the is Beowulf considered to be a a saga or a proper novel kind of way because I, if I remember uh, Beowulf was written in the by Anglo-Saxons not not by actual Scandinavians or Norse the hmm I think it was Anglo-Saxons who actually wrote Beowulf based on their knowledge of the Norse uh, people and the culture and the geography and that sort of thing don't remember exactly how, but isn't uh, Beowulf considered considered to be kind of like the first proper fantasy kind of book? And then, uh, because I know Beowulf, uh, Tolkien used Beowulf a lot. Like uh, Beowulf was just kind of, kind of like considered to be his main uh, inspiration to a lot of the Lord of the Rings. And then of course you real life events and that sort of thing. Well, the intervening period of the Second Age from the direct aftermath of Morgoth's downfall, right up to the usurpation of the role of Dark Lord by his former lieutenant, Sauron. Lord of the Rings takes an angle on fantasy where magic isn't so common, and it's the deeds of heroes... This is going to be commercials, right? But if you want to take your D&D yeah. campaigns in the opposite direction, with more magic, check out our... Sp the earliest period of the Second Age was one dominated by efforts of construction and consolidation in the aftermath of the Great Sundering wrought. I, I love this sort of cartography, I think it's called in English. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a sucker for making maps. I love reading about maps and uh, I even I even create some uh, fantasy maps for myself. I'm currently working on a really big one just because I, I like to do that. Am I planning to do something with, something with it? Like... Maybe it's it's fun. Like you can create your own world and you can populate whatever you want. I I consider it more like a hobby because it's really fun. Yeah, you, it's it's your own world. It's it's not like a video game where you're, where you are given a world to play with. Now you now you have something that you can make yourself. That's why I love when the fantasy world have maps and that sort of thing. So you can you can kind of like live into it much more proper. So, would I say the Lord of the Rings map or the World of Arda is one of the most iconic? Uh, by the Third Age, or probably, well, Second Age and the Third Age, yes, it's one of the most uh, iconic. First Age with the Beleriand and that sort of thing, and the, Ain the Land of Aenor, I think it was called. Was, I think it was called Aenor. Uh, the Land of the Gods, basically, and the Elves. Uh, not really. I mean, I would consider the Tamriel from the Elder Scrolls to be way more 
uh, recognizable than the than the first age Arda. Third age, then um, people are probably going to recognize him much more. Uh, the world of uh, Warcraft, mm, not really. Not neither the uh, the Warhammer universe. Now I'm talking about the fantasy one, not the space one. Uh, Aragorn, no. That was way too... That map was just way too simplified, in my opinion. The world... The map world of... This is not the... the this is just a small part of it, I know that. Because uh, I think around here is Linden, if I... I think this is the Blue Mountains above it, or below it. And then Linden in somewhere around in inside the bay, near the river part of it. Um, Shire should be somewhere around here, I think, in this general area, if I remember correctly. Where the top I think was called that uh, Ranger Watchtower, somewhere around here. The burrows. I guess maybe down here. Uh, I'm very rusty. <laughs> By the War of Wrath, in the first year of the Second Age, the Grey Havens were founded, and the population looked to Círdan to lead them forward. Likewise, the Kingdom of Linden was founded in that same year by Gil-galad, who ruled as the High King of all the Elves who had not gone into the West following the defeat of Morgoth. The Noldor dwelt primarily within Forlinden, whereas the Sindar and those Green Elves who elected to remain in Middle-earth dwelt in Halinden, a fiefdom ruled by Celeborn. However, tensions still ran high amongst the Elves of that time, as a number of the Sindar, who preferred not to live under the rule of Gil-galad and his Noldor, went east to live alongside the Sylvan Elves, who were their Teleryn kin. It is also likely that the surviving Edain resided alongside their Elven counterparts until Numenor was raised. This is one of the most awesome thing about the, the Tolkien world is that all the elves aren't really the same. They they have different not not sub races, but different cultures and different origin in sort of way. They have the same origin, absolutely, but they have different kind of like split off like like humanity itself. Like some went to Asia, some went to Europe, some went to, across the uh, the ice bridge to North America so the elves are pretty much the same in uh, in many in many regards even orcs have have their ori origins to elves in the um, first age was it first age I don't remember exactly I think it was the first age before the uh, before the, the age of the lambs or something like that humans Human and elves pretty much have the same origin place, like far east. Hmm. Is from the watery depths. As I said, uh, <laughs> sorry, but as I said, it, it, it's so cool that they have s showing that yeah, elves they they, they they have different languages. Sure, they may, might have one common one, kind of like in this old Scandinavian world back in the. Uh, Maybe eighteen eight hundred something like that when the Scandinavia Scandinavia were, well, no, no, I would probably just call it Scandinavia, uh, where, where the the Norsemen pretty much spoke of. They, they spoke the common language between one another. Like uh, people in Sweden could understand could uh, could could in, <laughs> could understand Danish and Danish could understand Norwegian and Swedish and Swedish. We could all speak one language. Eventually, it split off. So um, that's why we sounding a bit differently today. So it's kind of like the same with elves. Not so much with a human in this world. Don't rule. Don't really know why. The Adain who may have dwelt here received great counsel and education from the Maya Aeonwi prior to his return to the Utter West, which was to benefit them immensely in their new kingdom. Of the Edain, the House of Beor had nearly been killed to a man in the gargantuan struggle they waged against the Dark Lord. 
Therefore, what remained of this once mighty clan merged with the Hadorians, and the unified group they assimilated into became the Numenorians, under their first king, Elros, son of Eärendil. The brother of Elrond. Elrond had taken pity upon the Edain for their great suffering in a conflict which was never of their making. As a result, the Valar raised the island of Elena from the depths of the ocean, and in return for their suffering, granted it to the Edain who had fought by their side during the War of Wrath. So it was that Elros... Now we see a proper view of the Middle-earth. Um, yeah, the, the rise and fall of the Numenor, it's a, it's a unique story. It's, it's basically Tolkien's version of the... What was it called again? Atlantis. It, however, with a small twist to it and here and there. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just uh, looking at the map and trying to remember a lot of things like, uh, I think, eventually... Uh, first thing, the, you see a lot of force around on the Middle Earth right now. That's going to change because the Numenors are going to colonize Middle Earth and they are going to deforest the entire continent almost to every single tree <laughs> except for Mirkwood, I think it was called, and Lorien. And, uh, don't remember what this forest was called. Fang Fangor, right? Fangor Forest. Uh, yeah, these three forests are going to pretty much be left alone by the Numenorians, but the rest is just going to be cut down to every single piece. Um, let's see now. Uh, up here, one day, is going to be called the Kingdom, kingdom of uh, Aenor. And then further north, you're yeah, going to have the Kingdom of Angmar, which kind of like the Witch Kings. Uh, oh, yeah. Kingdom. However, it's directly influenced by Sauron, who's, who's spiritually trying to recover either in Mirkwood or in Mordor. I don't remember exactly his location during that time. Um, you're going to have... A, what was it called? It was not called Isengard. The Tower of... <laughs> don't remember. But basically Isengard is going to be around here. Uh, Karasak Dune, aka Moria, it's around here. Uh... Minas Tirith is going to be down here, and Oskilia, Baradur, somewhere around up here, Mount Doom here, Minas uh, Morgul, I think what's called, should be around here, uh, the, the Great Wall or something like that was, is supposed to be somewhere around here, and then this was like a raider city, the city of Umbar, right? Then you have, uh, what else? Fedra, somewhere around here. Helm's Deep, or the, what's it called? Hel Helmburg, something like that. Horn, Hornbury, right? Should be around here. Should Yeah, it should be around here. What else? Uh, those uh, statue, statues, I don't remember exactly what they were called. They should be around here, right? Uh, uh, the Lonely Mountain should be far off north of uh, Mirkwood. This is Mirk Mirkwood. And the uh, Bjornings are going to be located in this area. And uh, the City of Dale and the uh, Lake Town is... is I, I don't think this is the lake. No, it's much, much further north. Hmm. Uh, Rivendell. I think it's somewhere around the, up here. God, I love maps. <laughs> and then, of course, you have Numenor, but that one is going to be... It's going to vanish. Taking upon himself the name of Ta Minyata, meaning High First King, led his people to Elena, which was to be called Numenor in the year SA-32. The Numenorians possessed far greater lifespans, physical prowess, and, at least in the earlier days of the kingdom's history, greater wisdom than those of the men who continued to dwell upon the shores of Middle-earth. However, the ban of the Valar continued to apply to the Numenorians, in that they were forbidden from sailing so far westwards as to no longer be able to sight their fair isle. This ban was put in place to prevent the Edain from coming to the Undying Lands, a realm which men were forbidden from entering. Yeah, the ban of... Valinor, um, 
that's the one thing that's it's both intriguing confusing and uh, understandable in all all of all of the three combined because elves are are, are the only one of the uh, illuvatar's children so to speak to are allowed to go to Valnor because they are elves are undying beings they cannot die except from natural age that sort of thing they can't die by being killed and that sort of thing but they can't die by uh, age or natural causes except murder and that sort of thing why don't know i don't really know where he got that from because elves in norse mythology we don't have that much information about them because we do know that they they live in alfheim and that sort of thing but it's just there's so little information about the elves in the norse mythology so it's up for debates and that sort of thing still uh because if I remember correctly, elves in um, the Lord of the Rings are supposed to be the image of what our god in reality. Well, our god, I'm not religious, so uh, the the god of Christianity, Islam, yada yada yada, and all of that. When they cre- when he created Adam, Adam and Eve, they were supposed to be elves, kind of being, you know, like fair and beautiful, but because of the the, scene, the first scene or that sort of thing uh, is first seen by eating the apple of knowledge I think was called uh, that's that pretty much doomed humanity to become a mortal being so we became like mortals we would die from age, aging and that sort of thing kind of like the first original sin of humanity um, if we didn't commit or uh, I think it was Eve if she didn't commit to that sin uh, because she, she was manipulated by Lucifer to, or Satan or the devil, whatever, to uh, eat the apple. If she didn't eat the apple, we would still be kind of like elves kind of beings. According to Christianity, still a little bit up to inter, inter, what you call it, um, debate and that sort of thing. Uh, so the elves in uh, the Lord of the Rings are pretty much these undying beings they cannot die from aging so they go to Valnor which is just a massive continent dedicated just for the elves so they can live throughout their for eternity there I don't really know what plan Illuvatar had for elves except that there's going to be like a dooms doom day kind of like the Kind of like Ragnarok, there is going to be a destruction of the world eventually, and uh, bo- all of the races, elves, dwarfs, humans are going to be uh, going to uh, what you call now um, resurrect during the second world, and they are all going to live in har- har- harmony and the things. Just that's far way back. <laughs> uh, it's just theories by now. Um, I don't really know exactly why what plan Illuvatar have for the elves I don't rem- remember that but men cannot men is kind of like considered to be not the crown jewel of Illuvatar I don't really know if he favored the humans or the elves hmm because when elves are actually jealous for, on um, on humans because they can die from natural causes like aging so the elves are kind of jealous on humans for that because dying in this world means that you can go to heaven or in a spiritual heaven uh, alongside with Il- Illuvatar and that sort of thing and um, but the, the humans are jealous on the elves because they do not age they cannot die from aging from old age and that sort of thing so that is going to be kind of like a big sin for the humanity in this world later on during the fall of Numenor and at Ferrison and that sort of thing also thanks to uh, the manipulation of Sauron but uh, it's all it I think even without Sauron or Sauron I should pronounce it correctly without Sauron I think humanity would 
eventually uh, commit to that sin of invading Valinor and com- and uh, doom humanity, not humanity as a whole, but doom Numenor basically. I think even without Sauron, it would eventually happen because uh, greed and jealousy can can cause someone to do some really questionable things. This ban was strictly adhered to under the wise rule of the earliest kings of Númenor, for their respect and knowledge of the Valar following the close-won victory over Morgoth in the War of Wrath was substantial. The dwarves were also substantially affected by the War of Wrath, as the cities of Belagost and Nogrod in the Blue Mountains were effectively ruined by the upheavals caused by the mighty struggle spearheaded by the Valar. This caused the denizens of these cities to begin to migrate in SA-40 to Khazad-dûm, the realm of Durin's folk, effectively abandoning the homes which had sheltered them through the tumultuous First Age. This influx of broad beams and firebeards positively impacted the culture of Daradelph, as they brought with them a substantial number of fine smiths and artisans. The Chronicler, however, does not detail whether the remaining clans remained separate and distinct in their new home or if the groups were to effectively merge into a homogenous dwarven identity. As the dwarves and elves flourished upon Middle-earth proper, the kingdom raised by Ossi, established through the great works of Auli and enriched to its fullest by Yavanna, began to take shape. The gardens of Númenor were subsequently brought into being by the elves, who sought to reward their long-standing allies amongst the Edain. Four flowers and fountains were brought out of the city of Avaloni upon the island of Tol Eresia, serving to create a realm of men that Hurin, Tuor, and Turin, among others, could only have dreamt of during their defiant struggles. The island garnered many names, for the Valar called it Andor, or the Land of the Gift, whereas its own people oftentimes referred to it as Westernessi, due to the fact that it lay furthest west of all the lands inhabited by mortals. Its culture was one which was easily identifiable, yet in many respects alien to its ancestors, who had gladly laid down such torrents of blood to ensure the survival of their descendants. For it could not be said to be a part of Middle-earth, yet at the same time none could truly say that it was wholly separate from the land of their ancestors. The first king, Elros, was to provide a mark by which all others who came after were to compare themselves against. For, having turned down the immortality offered to him by the Valar, Elros Tamin Yauta came to the throne, aged 90, in the mighty Numenorian capital of Armenelos. The blade Aranruth, which had once been sheathed at the side of Elros's great-great-grandfather, Thingol of Doriath, the Ring of Barahir, and the Axe of Tuor, all became heirlooms of the kings of Numenor. Elros would also have four children throughout his 410-year reign, among them Vardamir Nolamon, Manwendil, Atenelkar, as well as... You know, if I would choose to live in a certain, well, year, I mean, eventually we are going to get, uh, we are going to cure aging, probably, but that's not going to happen, like, hundreds of hundreds of years from now, maybe, I mean, the, <laughs> look at how far technology has uh, gone now in the past, like, 40, 50 years. It wouldn't surprise me that eventually, maybe a hundred years, we will find a way to de-aging human. Maybe not going backward, but slow aging considerably. Um, but that 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 was I. Uh, that is the thing that I think is going to happen or theorize. I think uh, that eventually we are going to find a way to slow our aging, so we maybe be able to live. Maybe we live normal, like probably 90 years average, maybe. Maybe we can extend it to like, maybe like 120. But uh, maybe we can like slow aging so much that we can pretty much stay at our, at our, let's say 30, 30s, maybe somewhere around there, like 35 when we start to de, <laughs> properly going to de age, age, that sort of thing. So, but if I would choose something like a lifespan of the Numenor, I think it, it's, 
I think they were probably around 300 years. Aragorn lived for... How long was it? Was this like 170 something like that? Because he was... Uh, uh, he was a... Uh, he had Isildur's blood and... Uh, and uh, a blood of the Numenor. He was kind of like a... Semi-pure blood in Numenor. Human. So he lived a little bit longer than your average human. But 400. Uh, does it mean when we... Let's say like, do we age a hundred years and then we become uh, kind of like we look in a, in our parents. We are like in our thirties for the next 200 years. That would be interesting. But then you have to live with a hundred years of just your aging and your body becoming more fragile. No, oh, uh, no, no, I rather live a short life as a old human with fragile body and that sort of thing and with all the constant problem that's uh, going to be arrived by it then living a hundred years with it no uh, so i don't really know exactly how the how uh, it works in the lord of the rings exactly hmm as his daughter Tindomiel before passing in the year SA442. Vardamir Noliman was noted to be a scholar of exceptional talent, who despite his position as the eldest son of the king, desired not to rule, but only to continue his studies. Therefore, upon his father Elros's death, he accepted the crown of Numenor, only to immediately abdicate in favour of his eldest son, Tar Amendil. As a result, he is considered to be the second king of Numenor due to his nominal one-year reign and would die in SA 471, aged 410. Tar Amendil, who accepted the kingship of Numenor due to his father's abdication, was therefore counted as the third king of Numenor. He had three children, Tar Elendil, Eärendor, and his daughter Myrem, in what was otherwise an unremarkable reign. The main reason his reign had been recorded as one of note in the annals of Numenorian history is due to events which occurred on the mainland unbeknownst to the king or his subjects. Sauron, Sauron had begun to reassert himself in Middle-earth, beginning in the year SA 500, when he began to develop the first tendrils of strength which would be required in order to assume his role as heir apparent to the legacy of the defeated Morgoth. A stark contrast to his previous cowering before the host of the Valar and begging at the feet of Ionwi, which caused him to flee and hide rather than face his judgment in the utter west. Tar Emendil surrendered the scepter of Numenor in the year SA 590, by which his eldest son, Tar Elendil, was to come to the throne. Tar Elendil's reign was more noteworthy than that of his predecessor, for the Numenorians during his kingship, being the fine mariners that they were, began to embark on great voyages from their fair isle. It was, therefore, in the year SA 600 that the captain of the king's ships, Viantor, led such a voyage to the mainland of Middle-earth for the first time in the history of Numenor. Upon landing, they discovered groups of men who spoke languages which, although related to the Numenorian tongue, differed greatly in what came to be known as Aduani. After some deliberation, Numenorian scholars declared that this was due to the fact that these men were descendants of the fathers of the Edai. Known as the Atanatari, these men had not crossed over the Erid Luin and entered into Beleriand during the First Age, instead slowly migrating following the conclusion of the War of Wrath. Tar Elendil's succession also had some bearing over the future of the kingdom, as during his reign he had three children, the eldest daughter Silmarien, a middle daughter Isilmi, and the youngest son Iriman. Under the ordinary suppositions of full cognatic primogeniture, the throne should have passed to the eldest, Silmarien. However, this was not to be the case, as the laws of Numenor at the time followed the guiding principles of agnetic primogeniture, which effectively prevented women from ruling, and as a result, the eldest son, yet youngest child, assumed the kingship in SA 740, ruling as Tar Meneldur. Silmarien would then marry a nobleman of the vast port city of Andunii, called Elitan, and together they bore a child named Valendil, who became the first lord of Andunii. 
It is from this lineage of Valandil's subsequent descendants that the lines of the exiled kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor trace their ancestors. It is also presumed that upon the succession, the blade Narsil, in conjunction with the basically Aragorn's uh, ancestors, ring of Barahir, passed from father to daughter, eventually finding its way into the hands of a certain Aragorn, son of Arathorn. Tarmenildur's reign was marked by further expansion of the Numenorean navy, exemplified by his son Aldarion establishing the Guild of Venturers to further such expeditions east. This guild would come to be one of the most powerful of all organizations on the island, as the Numenorians continued to embrace their seafaring nature. During his reign, friendly relationships were established with the men of Middle-earth, who the Numenorians called Middlemen, as opposed to their own identifier of Edai or High Men. These diplomatic entreaties were supervised and supported by the Elves of Linden under Gilgalad's stewardship. A great many voyages were undertaken, which led to the first Numenorean settlements being established in Middle-earth. These temporary wayposts, unbeknownst to the mariners, would eventually become the core regions of the kingdoms in exile, Arnor and Gondor. These settlements also allowed greater contact with the Middlemen with such interactions eventually causing the Aduanic language to merge with that of the Numenorians, establishing Westron speech. Simultaneously, during the reign of Tarmenildur, the Kingdom of Eregion was founded by the Noldor in the year SA750, where it was to be ruled by Galadriel and Celeborn from the capital Ostinethil. This kingdom lay just outside the western gate of Khazad-dûm, and a firm friendship was soon established between the Noldor and Durin's folk who were continuing to expand the subterranean kingdom as they continued to prosper from mining and trade. Thus it seemed that all the races of Middle-earth had found a prosperous peace for themselves in the aftermath of the devastating conclusion of the First Age. However, this was not to last, as a great evil had begun to arise once more in the East, one which would bring death and devastation once more to the Free Peoples. However, this is a tale for our next video on the history oh, of the Second on. Age, which will focus on the return of Sauron, the corruption of the Numenorians, and the inevitable slide toward suffering and great sadness upon the shores of Middle-earth. The next few videos in this series will be dedicated to the efforts of the new Dark Lord to establish his dominance over all of Middle-earth, but we're planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi, and space opera universes. So Oop. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, that, that was fantastic. Uh, they do such an incredible job with their videos. They do talking uh, justice, absolutely. And many are, and, and many are, and many others. Uh, fantasy worlds. The one thing I also wondered about, because. Sauron is considered to, considered to be the father of werewolves, right? Where where were they during the War of Wrath? Not not the War of Wrath, but the Last Alliance and the War of the Ring. Couldn't he recreate them? Maybe there's an explanation to that. I, I maybe I, I should look after because that is kind of like a flaw. I I remember like he he used to have a lot, entire island of werewolves and that sort of thing. But where were they <laughs> during the uh, his later stages stages of his life? Uh, anyway, go and sub to Wisdom and Warriors. Fantastic channel. Just do it. Do it. They deserve it. Absolutely. So thank you all for watching and see you all later and it's probably going to be a review on uh, either Napoleon or it's going to be a review on uh, an anime review, figu anime figurine review which is Baltimore. She's on her way, she's probably going to arrive in Sweden maybe tomorrow or something like that. Well, I'm excited for that, I'm, a very, I'm very excited for that one. But anyway, see you all later.